I always like to start out asking when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh my gosh. Awesome. <laughs> Are, and that's what you're asking me now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wanted to be a bartender and a nun. <laughs> I'm from a small town and that's how do really, those two things go together? I'm from a small town, small Catholic community, and it just seemed like a perfect fit. <laughs> but now, then I, okay, I, I guess nuns <laughs> I guess nuns do drink a bit of alcohol, at least wine. And it seems like there's counseling involved in both jobs. So maybe uh, see, there was true, some true. sort of inherent people caring quality in me always. But uh, yeah, I wanted to be a nun and a bartender. And then uh, I wanted to be a lawyer because I think I was a very argumentative child. Mm. And um, then I, I think, you know, as I entered high school, I kind of fell into the track that probably a lot of chiropractic students fall into. You know, there's smart kids who are really good at science. So they end up going pre-med. Hmm. Interesting. I was not very good at science until the end of my, my undergraduate, I think. Oh, wow. Late bloomer. Um, oh, <laughs> chemistry and organic chemistry were my nemesis. Ah, uh, wow. I think I've mentioned a couple of times on this podcast, I had to retake the, each course, but then I, <clears throat> I aced it by the end. I mean, I was, I was really good at it. So, well, that's really interesting. So you, it sounds like you like talking with people. I do. Right? listening as well. That's something I'm trying to get better at, which is the reason <laughs> I do this podcast. How did that, how then did you transition from, <laughs> from wanting to be a, a bartending nun? Can I say that? Or a, sure, or a yeah. nun and a bartender? That would I, be I don't know if there's a, an order to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you transition that from that to healthcare, chiropractic? Uh, well, so I was in undergrad in a pre, really competitive pre-med program, and I had this moment. I remember being at the library surrounded by all my classmates, and, you know, we are drinking our 20-ounce Mountain Dews and smoking cigarettes at every break and taking who knows what to study all night, and it was hyper-competitive, and I just remember this moment of thinking, this is the most unhealthy group of people I have ever been around. And it was this revelation that this environment to train us to be compassionate healthcare providers was beating the compassion out of all of us. And I just realized it wasn't for me. It, it wasn't, I didn't want to continue on that path, especially if it was just going to become more competitive, more cutthroat and more intense. Um, so I went back to my dorm room and thought, you know, what am I going to do now? And I was reflecting back on my own healthcare experiences. And I'm, as I said, from a small town where our local chiropractor provides healthcare in a million different ways and is a really well respected member of our community. So I was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe chiropractic is a good way to go. There's a lot of autonomy. Um, you get to spend more time with individuals. I like talking and listening. And it just felt like, you know, a chiropractor really got to create those connections with mm -hmm. their patients. So I was thinking that was appealing. And then um, on a lark, I had my tarot cards read that evening. And um, the, the tarot this reader- getting more entertaining. You, you did not know what you were getting when you were, uh, signed me up here. But the tarot reader, first thing they said was, you, you know, you just made a huge different decision and don't question it, just go with it. And I thought, okay, chiropractic school, here I come. Wow. Everybody's got their own path, right? Okay. I'm going to have to figure out how you go from tarot reading to, to science and research. But um, what led you to, did you go to Northwestern? Is it, that's where I, you did your chiropractic program? Yeah, I did. I chose Northwestern because they had such a strong um, research program here. The curriculum is, is you know, heavily and deeply embedded um, in evidence-based concepts even before that was popularized in chiropractic. So it was a very good fit for me. So is that something you were aware of in your undergraduate? You said science was kind of a strength of yours, mm -hmm. but, but this idea of, I mean, you go, <laughs> you go from strong science undergrad to making a decision based on tarot reading <laughs> using a science-based program. I'm just trying to understand uh, the nuances. That, that's very, very interesting. Well, life is a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I, it's funny that you point that out. You know, I think that's part of what makes 
in all humility, I think that's part of what makes me good at what I do. I mean, research is my full-time gig, but I think I can relate to people, and that's what makes leveraging the research to inform healthcare policy an easy transition for me. And I get that feedback a lot where people say, you're a researcher, and, you know, it's... I'm going to take that as a compliment because I think the most successful people in our business are the ones who are, you know, excellent diagnosticians and um, technicians, but also have the people skills, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's right brain, left brain. And I think that that's a great recipe for success, especially in an emerging field like chiropractic. Yeah, I get that. I mean, I was drawn to chiropractic because of subluxation, innate intelligence, and my mm -hmm. religious beliefs that aligned with it. That's all changed as I've gone through this process, but that's kind of uh, what's behind this idea of exploring chiropractic. So that's mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. Um, you did your program at, at uh, Northwestern, and what, what got you into the research side of things? I, I think I, I began really having a hunger um, to learn more. You know, I think that's just my personality. And uh, after maybe I was in school for just a few trimesters, I was knocking on the door of our research department saying, I will, you know, work for free. I just want to kind of be immersed in this environment and learn, learn more about this process. And as I did, uh, I really grew to love it because it, it satisfied you know, both the patient contact um, time that I was desiring because we do clinical trials here primarily. And so I got to work with a lot of patients and really see some of the toughest patients uh, cases because mm. people who are inclined to enter a research study have probably tried everything else. So you know, I feel like I became an excellent diagnostician. I had really great interactions. I had the luxury of interfacing with patients in an environment where I didn't have to worry about billing and payment. I could just spend the time I needed to spend in the context of this trial with these individuals. So it was really a, I mean, a, it's a little Petri dish of a clinic, really, mm -hmm. but it was almost a utopian clinical environment to be in. So I loved that part. But then the other part of my job was this, you know, intellectually challenging kind of nerdy academic piece where I could ask questions and seek answers and constantly challenge and be challenged. And that really resonated for me. So a career in clinical research just felt like after I graduated, the perfect fit. And I was lucky enough um, that they created a, a position here for me at Northwestern to work in research. And from there, um, I had lots of other opportunities to increase my skill set relative to the conduct of clinical research and uh, be a, a bigger value add to our research team here. I think that speaks to a lot of people. Certainly, I identify with a lot of that. I mean, the, the intellectual side of it, I, you know, I don't know that I mentioned to my podcast audience yet, but I have a newborn at home and, and I find myself just wanting to have some free time to read. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I do miss seeing patients as well, but for some reason that's kind of the, the stronger urge. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think that, that urge to just always be learning more um, is prevalent in a lot of students. And so that's really interesting that research is, can be that pathway for them. It, it, um, it was my pathway, and I don't mean to imply that somebody in full-time practice it doesn't also have that same right. you know, need or quest. And, you know, I learned so much from clinicians, and there are many excellent ones who stay on top of the literature as well as I do. And I'm amazed because, you know, being involved in research is my job, and mm -hmm. their job is patient contact, and yet they're on top of it. So, you know, it just happened to be the right pathway for me at the time to kind of pursue both of those passions. And it sounds like you went directly into research without doing, uh, having clinical experience, any full-time um, position in a clinic. Is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've never pra I've never had my own practice, and mm -hmm. all of my patient experience has been in the context of clinical research studies. I'm curious your thoughts on that because there's this this kind of idea, um, you know, that you'll hear that if you can't do teach, which I've never agreed with, but there's a similar sentiment, especially within chiropractic, that if you don't have clinical experience, number one, you can't teach, but also if you do research, then it's not as valid. Mm. And I don't really understand that. What are your thoughts? Well, I see two sides of the same coin in that whole argument, which I've certainly heard myself many times. You know, one side of that is, you know, research is a specialized skill set. 
um, just because you're a good clinician wouldn't make you a good researcher and vice versa. So there may be people who, you know, maybe their, their skill set or their interest really does drive them towards research. Um, research is a team sport and no study is going to be a good study if it lacks clinical relevance. I mean, that's kind of from an evidence-informed practice perspective. You have to ask yourself, you know, does this piece of research relate to my practice? If not, you know, move on because you've got a lot of things to do. So when you do research, you really want to make sure that you have both clinician and patient and other stakeholder input in your research question and your research design so that it is applicable. So whether or not you as an individual researcher have that clinical expertise, whatever that might mean, um, you know, you really need to work as a team with others to make sure that you're creating some knowledge that actually matters at the end of the day. I know a lot of excellent research scientists who I would explicitly trust with um, providing health care to me or my family. So I, I think that's a pretty unfair um, blanket statement to make that just because you can't, you know, if you can't do, you teach. I, that, mm -hmm. That's total baloney. I've always <laughs> felt it's baloney. quite the opposite. I, I feel like if you, that teaching is such a specialized skill that if you can't teach, then you should just do it. Mm. Right? I, yeah, it could cut both ways very easily, and neither are probably true. I think the the truth behind that really is, um, I think for a lot of clinicians, research is a kind of a mysterious, unknown thing that's out there, yeah. and it's easier to put it down and put it off than really try to engage it. And I think that's what breeds comments like that. Mm, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, research from my perspective is a. Uh, objectivity at its finest. I mean, the ideal of research is, and it shouldn't matter what the skill set is. If you're being objective, then that can apply mm -hmm. to, to all areas. So yeah, certainly, well, you're definitely, um, have a lot of experience in the research field. I was just briefly looking through your research gate profile and some of the papers that have come out. Mm. Um, a lot of research on, on patient center outcomes, um, but the, the paper that really got my attention just came out in the, the Journal of the Canadian Chiropractic Association on millennials. And this is so interesting. This is such a, a great concept. And I believe you gave a presentation similar to this at um, NCLC, at the big uh, WFC and NCLC conference last year. Mm -hmm. So we're, I'd love to get into this and talk about this idea of millennials in chiropractic. Yeah, let's let's do it. It's a fun topic. And it's something that, you know, if we're not thinking and talking about now, we, before we know it, the generation behind them is going to be in front of us. So we we need to, to start thinking and talking about this. Yes, so take us through this idea of generations, because I've, mm -hmm. I, I hear these names all the time. But I guess until I read this paper, I hadn't really understood how they kind of divide. And so we, we go back to the beginning of of the 20th century, so the, the early 1900s up until it sounds like about 1945. Mm -hmm. And this group we call the traditionalist. The traditionalists, sometimes they call them the greatest generation for the contribution mm -hmm. and sacrifices they made with the world wars. Um, sometimes they call them the silent generation because we generally think of older adults in our society as as being more silent participants, um, you know, growing up in an age where you're seen and not heard. Um, so they, they have a few different, few different names. And, you know, the, these, these cutoffs, these year cutoffs depend really a lot of times on what source you're looking at. But generally speaking, you know, people born in that first half of the 20th century are referred to as, as traditionalists. Mm -hmm. So that's my grandparents. They were mm -hmm. pretty good uh, example of that. My grandfather was a, a um, uh, in the World War, was a conscientious objector, objector and mm -hmm. was Quaker as well. So he was that silent mm. uh, generation in in many ways. Very um, interesting. And that takes us into the next generation, which are the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is kind of that group that is coming into retirement now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're coming into retirement now um, and really changing what retirement looks like. I mean, I, I think there was a kind of a, a socially accepted um, you know, assumption like, oh, you retire and you just sort of sail off into the sunset or you kind of 
hunker down at home and just take mm-hmm. care of and love your grandkids. But Knits baby and boomers crochet. today, yeah, right. You know, get out your knitting needles. But baby boomers today are really a different group. I mean, they have wildly different expectations for for what healthy aging looks like. They are not not only because they are living longer and have, I think, the luxury of really thinking about how am I going to keep myself healthy until I'm 80 or 85 Mm -hmm. or 90? Um, But just, I think their life experience has shaped them in a way that they demand a lot more. And so they are demanding functional mobility. They are demanding um, healthcare that fits their needs instead of the other way around. So they are really, I think, shaping up um, gerontological care. And it's almost funny to talk, you know, words like geriatrics aren't even used anymore because, this gen that generation you know they're like i'm not a geriatric person i'm only 70 so <laughs> you know it's, it's it's changing just even how we talk about older adults right and that brings us into generation x those born between 1965 1980 mm-hmm. what are their characteristics um <laughs> i'm a gen xer um and there are a lot of individuals. I, I had mentioned in the paper, you know, this is the latchkey generation where um, for the first time in U.S. history, there were often two working parents. So this generation of kids were left a lot of times to their own devices. And because of that, um, really became, I think, more focused on self. Um, independence is the plus side of that. Um, self-centeredness and disconnected from a greater society is the downside of that. Mm. So, you know, it's the um, flannel wearing kind of doing my own thing um, <laughs> stereotype. Is this the I hipsters? Uh, I lived well, in we, Portland for a while. That, oh, bringing it well, Portland's always stuck in the 90s. Isn't that what <laughs> Portlandia right. would tell us? So, <laughs> It's incredibly accurate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Gen X, you know, what's interesting about these these generations, and of course, they're sweeping generalizations of these different generations. And, and they're oftentimes, it's only in retrospect that they really codify what the definition of these generations are based on mm-hmm. shared life experiences, major world events, what's happening with the economy, those kinds of things. And, um, you know, I, I still think there might be more to what what helps define Gen X as time moves forward. Okay. So that brings us into the millennial generation, which I would be a part of. Um, Those born between 81 and 2000, Mm -hmm. you call them the most educated generation to date. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of people associate technology as well. So that's something we'll talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, What else makes the millennials unique? Globalization. You know, then the technology is really just this tool that amplifies how global a millennial society is compared to any generation before them. You know, when I was growing up, going somewhere big was was like the county next door. Um, And for um, millennials today and then the generation behind them, I mean, going somewhere big is pulling their phone out of their pocket. It's it's. It's amazing the difference. You know, I heard a, mm-hmm. a really great um, story on National Public Radio a little while ago, and it was talking about the, the 10 sounds millennials are likely to never hear. And okay. it were things like um, the exploding flash from a, an old camera or yes. a typewriter or mm-hmm. the sound of the rotary phone, um, dial up, you know, stuff that isn't even all that old. And it was <laughs> humbling and shocking to think about just how fast technology and, and globalization are accelerating and how easy it is for me as a Gen Xer to already feel like I can't run my phone. <laughs> like I feel like my grandparents who couldn't program their VCR. I mean, that is me with right. the technology today. So it's it's amazing because the millennials have access through technology to so much um, information, networks, um, you know, you name it. 
and the downside of that is is that they have to keep up but you know luckily the the technology i think is engineered in a way that makes sense to millennials that might mm -hmm. not make sense to a gen xer certainly less so to a baby boomer and and to a traditionalist so it's it's interesting to see how sharp that curve is that technology curve is and how millennials respond to it and how they're being pushed by the generation behind them in those fields that acceleration is crazy and i mm -hmm. i'm a millennial i you know we have this idea of a digital native native i like to think of myself kind of dual citizen <laughs> nature is a deep value for me you know i grew up with a rotary phone i remember having the camera with a flash bulb mm, you, know, wow, okay. like, you know 12 flashes that you could use on it uh that was pretty fun and you know computers came out and i i, I picked up the technology very quickly but i find myself already not getting snapchat I just mm. I don't get it. I'm on there, but I just don't get it. And, uh, you know, and all these new social networks that come out, um, that acceleration is, is rapid. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us at the beginning of the millennial generation are already feeling like we're kind of getting pushed out. <laughs> and I think that's by design sometimes. It very well could be. <laughs> very well could be. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that this generation strives to connect with the why, but that's something very important to them. And sure enough, on my podcast, the most recommended book is Simon Sinek's Start With Why. And that's very popular in this generation. Why is that why so important to us? I th if, great question. I mean, you know, you read Simon Sinek's work and you're like, well, yes, of course. I mean, the why is the, is the core of everything. But I think millennials have had this opportunity to reflect on society, to reflect on, um, you know, the political and economical situations and see so much of what's wrong really stems from not having a commonly held commitment to a shared why. And so I think that um, in their exuberance to, you know, save the world, which is something every, I think, young generation moving through their 20s and 30s, you know, espouses this aspiration, right, to make a difference, which is great and probably is what keeps the human race going. Um, I, I think the millennials have been wise enough and have had the, the vantage point of seeing through their networks, their global networks, um, that they should be asking why, because the whys are different all over the world. And in some places, the whys are more crystallized and result in better systems. And in other places, you clearly see where the why is, is, is missing maybe what society's needs are, for example, or otherwise. So I, I don't know, it's sort of an, I don't know, a, a fluffy answer to your question, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's just a reflection of that they, they're, they're sitting on this perch to see around the world um, which whys are working and which whys aren't working. Whereas I think generations before only knew what was in their backyard. And so the why just was more of a given versus a, well, what's your why? And what's the why over here? And thinking through the purpose more so than just the mechanics of this is the way things are. Right. I wonder, I wonder if we're at a time now where we have the luxury of caring about the why. I mean, you mentioned the traditionalists, they were all about kind of saving the world because it was about everyone else. It was about the nation. It was about um, protecting from global war. Um, the Gen Xers were all about themselves because now they, they didn't have to worry about the war. They, they could then worry about themselves. And now we're kind of to a point where, I don't know, maybe you think of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where that's all taken care of. Mm -hmm. we're, we're safe. We're, you know, we're, we're wealthy. We're um, in a good place. Now we can start to think about the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a, yeah, that's a fantastic observation. And I, I love that you use this word, you know, we're, we are privileged today. Mm -hmm. It's a luxury to be able to think about the why. I think you're absolutely right. And that whole privilege is used like a dirty word with millennials. Yeah, privilege or even that, that idea of entitlement. Yeah. I mean, you hear these young whippersnappers coming out, they're entitled to, you know, so we're, let's talk about chiropractic and how this relates. Yeah. New grads are coming out and, and I think a lot of them are frustrated that they're not being paid well. It's hard to find a good position. Um, they're being taken advantage of as associates. And the pushback I hear from that older generation is, well, you're not entitled to a good position. You're not, you've got to put the work in. Um, 
is this is this uh, you know th- is this a characteristic of millennials that they're entitled and they want the best straight out of the gate? Uh, yes and no. You know, I and again, this is where the sweeping generalizations get us into trouble, right? I mean, are there some who really feel entitled? Like they should be handed this because their helicopter parents have made everything easy for them always. It's been handed to them all along. You know, I'm, sh- I'm sure that is the case sometimes. But in my experience working with millennials, I, it, that's not it at all. And it feels like a, a miscommunication, which is probably why I was excited to write this paper. Um, it seems like millennials and uh, uh, previous, you know, people from older individuals from other generations are just missing we're missing one another from a communication perspective. It's not a a sense of entitlement. It's a lot of times I think a sense of fairness in millennials Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that place of privilege, not quite understanding, you know, why should I have to work my way up from, you know, making, you know, this pittance to earn your trust, to then have some kind of stature, to then be making a livable salary. Right. Um, Whereas I can imagine somebody from a previous generation saying, that's what I had to do. You know, I started working in a state where there was no, there was no chiropractic license. I had to fight every day for this. I, you know, the school of hard knocks taught me how to be a good professional and I want that for you too. So, School of Hard Knocks, here you come. And that's still the generation that experienced, if not directly, the, the, the repercussions of the so-called medical war on chiropractic. And that's what's so dangerous about how, how we are thinking about this today. Um, being, and I'm, I work at Northwestern Health Sciences University still, and um, I cringe every time I hear our students exposed to talk like... Um, you know, we have to fight for our stature. Um, you know, like the the, medic, the medical community is our opponent or, you know, we have to sh- fight for market share. And I I hear these this battle language, this warlike language, and I understand where it comes from, from previous generations, you know, instructors or, um, you know, certainly mentors to a lot of students. I understand where that comes from. But I don't, I mean, having had that lived experience, I'm not sure that they can break free of it in a way that doesn't then unnecessarily burden the next generation of chiropractors. Mm -hmm. I think that experience was real, I think. Oh, for sure. But I I don't know that it's, uh, that it applies now. Yeah, I don't, it's not so real today. I mean, sure, there are pockets. Mm. Um, But instead of, you know, chiropractors are quacks which I have never once heard out of the mouth of someone in my career, unless it was a story someone was telling me about years past, which I've heard millions of those. Um, It's more like, explain this to me, or how do I find a good chiropractor? Because, you know, the evidence is there and, um, you know, I'm a physician and I don't, I don't, I don't have the right tools in my toolbox. You know, everybody's talking about chiropractors. How do I know who to refer to? I mean, that's the conversation I have with medical um, peers. It isn't, you know, where are your horns? Right. <laughs> they're, they're much more open. In fact, uh, in the area I live here in South Dakota, um, there's ongoing talks. Let's build an integrative clinic. Let's bring together acupuncture and chiropractic and massage yeah. with the medical uh, facility. Yeah. So that globalization isn't just, um, you know, political, but it's, but it's interprofessional. And mm-hmm. I think this integrative approach uh, is just natural. For the millennial generation, that's what they expect. That's uh, it's nothing new to them. It's just the way it is. And that's the huge opportunity for chiropractic. I mean, we, and for some good reasons, have a hard time escaping our past and that that battle mentality. And the millennials present our profession with a really amazing opportunity to you know, have a beginner's mind when it comes to how do we work interprofessionally. Um, and and they're, they're, they will be good at it because they are good communicators um, because of the way they do view diversity, not as an assimilation process, but as a process that really honors what makes each person distinct. 
Um, and that's very different from the way generations in the past have looked at, at it. So they are perfectly suited for integrative multidisciplinary type clinical settings. So let's talk about the skills that they offer. And we've mentioned technology a number of times. Uh, we've got social media. They're comfortable getting online, doing the Snapchat, posting videos. How is this going to benefit chiropractic going forward? Mm -hmm. Well, I think chiropractic has been really slow to use social media and, and web-based platforms in a really positive way. We are excellent at the mudslinging on social media, um, but not so excellent when it comes to how do we create great patient education modules that can be widely available, spread, you know, using all of these different technologies. Telemedicine is, is certainly important, especially in rural areas. I'm sure in South Dakota, there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. about telemedicine. You know, why aren't the chiropractors getting on this bandwagon? And it's not like we're remotely adjusting somebody. It's how do we do um, patient education, um, exercise interventions, those, those kinds of things to deal with self-efficacy and kinesiophobia and help empower people to manage their musculoskeletal health better. I mean, huge missed opportunity. And we're just sort of sitting on the sidelines until we can probably complain that somebody else beat us to it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a, a million different ways that we can leverage technology beyond having an electronic health record. I mean, I, I feel like chiropractic offices are like, oh, I've got an EHR. I'm good. And that is, <laughs> I'm in the new millennium. I've got, right, well, I, type it well, in. I even dictate into ChiroTouch. Right. So welcome to 2002. Exactly. But, you know, we, we, have to not, we have to both be thinking about 2018 and five years from now and anticipate those technology trends and what do we need to do. And that's where, you know, some of the patient registries, getting chiropractic offices dialed into patient registries is a really exciting opportunity. Um, but we have to be more tech savvy when it comes to um, how patients are reviewing online healthcare providers. You know, we have relied as a profession on the incredible satisfaction that our patients have with chiropractic care, but we haven't been using online platforms to message that right now in the way we should because we have something really to trumpet and we're not doing as good of a job as probably sh we should. Mm -hmm. Some of your research, I think, has dealt with um, um, patient reporting, uh, quality metrics, and then also uh, adverse events. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that I just haven't seen yet, which I've been waiting and waiting it because we're, you know, there's always big talk about um, vertebral artery dissections and, mm -hmm. oh, but it's not causation, but we don't have the data to report these things. And I think once we get that type of technology built where every clinic can put in adverse events and show, you know, bring that data together. So this big data um, is something that's really coming to the forefront, um, not just the EHRs, but these interactive systems where we can start seeing what are the trends. Yeah, you start using that for research purposes, but also to help improve our clinical care. You know, if, if you're seeing what your trends and trajectories are for your patients and how that is mapping compared to similar patients and similar clinics, you know, how do we use that then to learn, gosh, I kind of need to shore up this area. What continuing edge should I take mm -hmm. to help me be better in this space or dealing with that condition instead of, you know, what's my local college hosting at their event this year <laughs> and just taking right, those, you know, right. <laughs> there's ways to tailor improving chiropractic practices in a way that, that surpasses probably what any healthcare profession is really doing today. But, you know, there's some incredible power in the numbers. That's interesting. So you can self-assess, you can see how you compare to the other doctors and clinics and either focus on what you need to improve or maybe see what your strengths are and mm -hmm. really target that to separate yourself. Right. I mean, it's, it's a totally different spin on um, kind of what third party payers are doing, where they say, these are your metrics. These how, are how you're comparing against the other chiropractors in this network. So now we're going to use this to put you in a different tier or to limit or those kinds of things. Well, let's, let's flip that on its head. Let's use the data, oftentimes the same type of data, to help us, as you say, identify what are our strengths. How do we leverage and maximize those? How do we shore up what our deficiencies are and not, you know, moan about it, but, but fix it. Fix it and be better. Be better contributors. I mean, I think that 
helps our individual practices, obviously can be helpful to improve the quality of patient care, but also is a huge thing that could help us build more trust among other types of healthcare disciplines in the broader healthcare system. I love that. You mentioned that this, this generation is uh, very engaged globally. Um, you use this word in this article on micro volunteering. Can you describe that? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I think oftentimes um, people think about volunteering and getting involved uh, maybe with their professional associations or some kind of cause that they're interested in. And, and a lot of people shy away from that because they think it's going to require lots of hours, lots of do- dollars, um, you know, time, talent, and treasure. And it, was, it would be this burden on top of an already burdensome life, um, being busy, especially for a millennial who may be just starting their practice, starting young families. Um, so this, this notion of, of micro-volunteering has arisen and is really popular with millennials. And that is, it gives people small, bite-sized ways to contribute um, you know, the smallest version is liking something and passing it along on social media. Um, and that generates buzz. That shapes um, kind of a, a cultural perception of a group. You know, there are small ways that actually that can have a huge difference. Um, you know, look at, um, for anybody who follows politics, uh, Obama's campaign. I mean, so much of the success of his campaign was based on micro-volunteering. Small donations, social media, creating a cultural shift of consciousness, um, creating buzz. These are, I mean, these were millions of people doing super small things that actually completely, you know, took somebody who was kind of an unknown just a few years before and brought them to the White House. So there's a lot to be said about micro-volunteering, and um, it's interesting to think about how we can better engage millennials in, in giving back to the profession in a way that makes sense for them. Because you know, a 10-year trajectory to become a leader of your state association isn't realistic for most people. Right. And I think if, if our more senior leaders in the profession were, were frank with themselves, it really wasn't convenient for them either. Um, oftentimes, by the time you're, you reach being the president of your association or something, you're already pretty burned out. Um, and, and understandably so. So we need to really kind of think differently about how to engage, especially this next generation, in volunteering and engaging in chiropractic in a way that meets them where they're at, but can also be tremendously effective. I've seen some interesting examples of this. Um, in, my, in my work with World Spine Care and World Spine Day, um, a lot of the schools have you know, the students have gone out dressed up as vertebrae and gone out to their <laughs> city park and just to spread the word, uh, of course, and they post that to Facebook and Instagram and then they create a video mashup. I think it was the World Congress of Chiropractic Students created this mashup of World Spine Day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so fun ways that don't take a lot of effort on an individual's part, mm-hmm. but it's, it's this idea of crowdsourcing comes yeah. together, kind of the Kickstarter generation. I was just yeah. watching an interview with one of the co-founders and, you know, over the years they've raised $2 billion in Kickstarter projects. And there's no, you know, individuals that would be able to contribute that, that money, but just a dollar, $5, $10 here. And it all comes together to create something incredible. So I think yeah. that's, uh, that's an interesting outlook that we have that, that chiropractors, students can contribute on an individual yeah. level just by using their phones. Oh, for sure. And I, you know, I, anytime a student is like, well, I'm, anytime I hear I'm just a student, I'm like, all right, we're having a sit down because <laughs> there's no such thing as just a, um, you know, you, you have a voice, you have power, and actually you can leverage your voice in ways that uh, a lot of your mentors actually don't have that kind of platform. Um, so there are tremendous things that, you know, even a chiropractic student, um, can do to really make a difference. And, you know, chiropractic students are so fantastic in the way that they, I mean, they do have a network among other chiropractic students and they have these broader social networks and community networks and, you know, just pull the lever on that kind of engagement. It's tremendous. Mm -hmm. And that gives them the encouragement to then continue on and do bigger things. Gets them prepared yeah. to, to volunteer on a bigger scale as they, as they go along. Yeah. One of the uh, kind of characteristics that is often attributed to, to millennials is 
is idealism. And I'm, I'm told this a lot that I'm a, an <laughs> idealist. Um, and again, that, that usually comes with a negative connotation, hmm. but is this a positive attribute? Oh my gosh. Where would we be as a society if we didn't have young people at any point in history pushing with their idealist convictions? Where would we be? It would be, I, it would not be a good place for sure. And we see that whether they were the traditionalists or the baby boomers or Gen Xers, there's always a push, right? A push from behind, a push from who's coming up in the ranks. And it's oftentimes their, it's their ideals that make them push. And that push is what spurs people who are currently in power to either do and be better or move aside. And that mm -hmm. I think is the only way that we have a culture that continues to innovate and change and aspire to be more. I can't help but think of Elon Musk, who's definitely an idealist, uh, with the idea of building rockets by himself and then taking us to Mars. And, and he's accomplished a lot. There's still a lot of people that think he's going to fail, but he, he doesn't care if he fails. It's, it's the process of doing those things. I think that's an interesting example. Yeah. Um, well, and, and what is failure? I mean, failure is the opportunity to learn and to do mm -hmm. better. I, and that's another wonderful thing. I mean, I, with, with idealistic millennials, I, you know, there isn't that same kind of shaming with failure that I see perhaps in my generation or generations before. You know, failure was a bad thing. And I really right. think that we've got this generation of people who don't see it like that. And, and maybe part of that is because, you know, it's a short news cycle you know, your failure today, forgotten tomorrow, no big deal. And so I, I really see a lot of millennials who are willing to, you know, put themselves out there and be vulnerable. And that's all okay, um, which I think is just brilliant. Maybe that comes back to their emphasis on the why, as long as their mm -hmm. why is right, the what and how, well, you could, you screw up that well, you change it because you are convicted to your why um, versus other, other groups who maybe were fixated on the process um, or the gains, the outcomes. Um, that's where failure is a lot more high stakes because you don't have that room to learn and grow. Um, and I, I think that is really different with millennials. I wonder if you can think of any any examples that you might have noticed where a chiropractic student or a group of young chiropractors have exhibited this idealism and, and how that's turned out? Okay, I'm putting you on the spot, but can you think of any, any examples? I know you work with a lot of students, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of young doctors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, idealism generally... Uh, they, they aren't getting, it seems like they aren't getting bogged down or they're not bogged down yet by the interprofessional conflict. Instead, they have these ideals of what they feel like um, the chiropractic profession can and should be, and they're aspiring to big things. Um, they don't see the same kind of limits and obstacles that I think somebody who's been in the trenches, to use another war term, um, feels up against. And so, you know, I, I hear millennials all the time, you know, lobbying their legislators with these messages of, you know, show me why this doesn't work. Hmm. Show me why, you know, we're, we're, you know, I'm hearing from you, congressman, that, um, you know, you recognize the value of chiropractic care and the potential cost savings, so on and so forth. You know, what is it that actually is the obstacle? And, you know, asking for some real answers. And it's this, these beautiful moments of, you know, it's not naivete. They get the broader political picture. I think it's really challenging. You know, what is the norm and setting out, these are what my expectations are as a constituent voter. And I, it's, it's not bully like we would see, I think, in some other generations, but it's really seeking to understand. And that's maybe part of this generation being a lot of really good communicators. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like they want to participate in solutions more often than I'm going to come in and fix things. They want to fix it with you. They want to explore it with you. This notion of a fix probably is kind of a, a false sense of security that a lot of other generations have anyway. I don't think millennials are, are fixated on the fix because they're more interested in the why. Interesting. A couple classmates and, and I guess friends that I've had have been involved in kind of a subgroup of the ACA, and I think you're involved with this as well, which is called the Millennial Think Tank. 
Um, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on your experience with this. And I interviewed Brendan McCann, who was one of the kind of the originators of it. Um, maybe it's been two years now. And I'm curious what the update is. What, what are they involved with? What are their goals? And how has it been going? Yeah, well, it's been brilliantly fun. I'll just start out with saying that. It started about two years ago. Um, it seemed like we were having this perennial problem where we had amazing leaders in the Student American Chiropractic Association, great thinkers, you know, clear leaders, um, well-connected, fantastic ideas, uh, great energy, and then they would graduate to become full ACA members and not have a landing place within the organization because you know, it takes time to build more experience um, and leadership skills to then become a leader within the ACA. Um, and sometimes they were going to their state associations or looking for other opportunities, but really wanted to stay involved with the ACA, um, who, who is an amazing organization. And so we came up with this idea to create the Millennial Think Tank, just as a, a landing place for early career practitioners who wanted to continue to build their leadership skills, explore ideas, and have, maybe not have, create more appropriately, create opportunities to continue to make a difference um, in whatever way was accessible to them as they were starting their practices, growing their families, moving, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And so we birthed the Millennial Think Tank, which just started out as a monthly, whoever wanted to get on a conference call, we're just going to take on a some topic in chiropractic and and discuss it and come up with some kind of actionable items that come from it. And we have developed um, really great project ideas that we're looking for funding for to increase chiropractic exposure within um, um, underprivileged communities. We are doing um, you know, lots of big and small projects for the ACA. One of the, the biggest projects um, that the Millennial Think Tank has taken on is that um, the ACA has recently undergone this whole rebranding process and a new governance restructuring. And as part of that, we wanted to update the ACA's mission and vision statement. And the president asked the Millennial Think Tank to write it, <laughs> which is, I think, an incredible signal of confidence and and really seeing the future in the value of this generation of chiropractors. And that was, that was a, a, it's a heady project. Um, and they took it on brilliantly and came up with something that was unanimously approved by our board. And they, it's our mission and vision and value statements today. And I think it, it resonates so well, both with, you know, the, the more um, experienced generation of the ACA, but also the new ACA members and the student ACA members, um, because it really speaks towards this sort of broader view of patient-centered, evidence-based collaborative care. I think it does resonate a bit more with that younger generation, and it feels more inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of, as you mentioned, the students who are so involved with SAC and then they graduate and then they become this little fish in a big pond of the ACA. Yeah. And there is that kind of 10-year incubation before they can actually do anything. So I think the Millennial, millennial Think Tank is going to be a nice uh, landing platform, as you call it, to well, help and, them and, get involved. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, help them get involved. And, uh, you know, that, that seems a little paternalistic of me to say because mm -hmm. they've done so much. I think it's more now um, create a platform so they can better contribute. Mm -hmm. and help us um, because we need them as much as they need. They are ACA. I hate to make it an us or them thing. And, right. and actually in recognition of that, um, I, we're looking at completely changing the structure to make it even more inclusive and to give it a little more prominence within the organization. And that, that was suggested from the ACA's leadership. So, you know, it, it there's a clear understanding and appreciation of what, what the next generation of chiropractic leaders has to contribute. And if we don't engage them today, we're missing out on a huge opportunity. Speaking of the next generation, we're in 2018. So yeah. those born post-millennial after the 2000s are now coming to the point where they're going to enter college, I then know. enter chiropractic school, uh, if they so choose. Um, what, what's the future hold? <laughs> Great question. You know, they're, they're already kind of debating names. Is it the, the iGen? Um, 
I don't know what letter. I think that's trademarked by Apple. Oh, which, which could be, they might be the, I don't know what they'll be, but you know, again, so much of um, what defines a generation is determined by something that happens. So it's done retrospectively. Um, you know, we could look at this generation and um, global terror, um, 9-11. These are, these are seminal events that have definitely shaped culture at a really formative time in their upbringing. Um, you know, as we had mentioned earlier, technology excel is accelerating in this crazy kind of way. So it's hard to know what they're going to be like. I think what we are going to see, though, is that these generational labels are going to cover smaller and smaller windows of time. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be interesting to see um, how these labels change or don't change um, as we're labeling a global audience and not just a North American audience is probably what had been historically done with some of these labels. Um, so I think that'll be really fascinating. I, don't, I wonder how much artificial intelligence is going to shape mm. this generation and, and how they behave and perform. Maybe it's less about communicating with people and more about communicating with technology in this web of things that we're finding ourselves in. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, Chiropractic ex machina. Right. <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's what we need this generation, the millennial generation of chiropractors to help us all anticipate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guide us through this next uh, couple decades. Right. <laughs> right. I know. And, you know, I, I think the, the most unfortunate thing would be if we, as has traditionally happened, and not just for chiropractic, but, you know, across the board, waiting for generations to gain enough leadership experience, gain enough stature, gain enough whatever until they're in the later part of their career to really um, take advantage of the strengths that they bring to the table. That has been, I think, a mistake of how um, generations of the past have operated and it's not to fault them. I think that's how things were done, but we need to think toward doing things differently. And that means engaging the millennials now, but also engaging the millennials to help us engage the generation behind them soon. And it's happening in other areas. We've, we've just seen politically the first millennial uh, head of state. I can't remember which country it was, Sweden or Finland or something, something in Europe where, uh, you know, a 35 year old is now the president. Yeah, the really a so. lot of, lot of progressive governments. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. And I, I think a lot about the, um, you know, at the time that we're doing this podcast, the Me Too sexual harassment mm -hmm. um, conversation continues to evolve. And, and there's also a side conversation about backlash against that. And I'm wondering, as we see more um, younger heads of state, um, leaders of corporations, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, hello, mm -hmm. um, will there be a, an ageism backlash or not? And I, I really, mm -hmm. yeah. I hope not. But, you know, it's kind of something else to be thinking of and to be cognizant of, especially as, um, you know, we like to think about, you know, these people pushing on the heels of, of current leaders. Millennials also have to think about how they make space to retain that cultural and historical wisdom and experience of the people who paved the road for them. You know, it's standing on the shoulders of giants and it doesn't mean you cast away the giant. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I, I think that's something else that the millennials really can bring to the table is, is finding again, good collaborative ways to not just create their new future, but, but really work with, um, the their their predecessors, um, and especially to, in healthcare, where the baby baby boomer generation is the largest population, that is, uh, you know, they're going into retirement. Their Medicare is coming, you know, uh, they're kind of the biggest sector of healthcare right now. Healthcare consumers. Yeah, they are a huge, those. powerful lobby, um, and they are demanding more of a system that isn't designed to fit their needs. So mm -hmm. if millennials can step in and help create systems that meet their expectations, uh, huge practice opportunities. I know when I do some lecturing at different colleges, talking with chiropractic students, I'm always like, who wants to care for pediatrics? And all kinds of people raise their hands. And who wants to care for athletes? And people are all excited. I'm like, and who wants to care for old people? <laughs> 
And I don't get quite the same response, but I'm telling you, you know, that is a brilliant space to consider if you're going to have a niche practice because healthy aging, you know, you're going to have a tremendous population base to draw from. And there is a lot that chiropractic can offer these folks. Well, Dr. Mize, it's been a pleasure. It's, uh, I really appreciate your optimism and I hope that the chiropractic students and recent grads who listen to this podcast take courage and embrace their skill set and put it to use within their chiropractic practice um, and even put it to use before they graduate because as you said there is no just student they have the potential to contribute uh, even before they're out there in their own clinic or as researchers or whatever it is that they choose to do with their career any last uh, words of advice and encouragement to the millennial generation? I, you know, I think what you summarize is really good. I mean, they just, it's easy to feel like you don't know anything when you're going through school and you're bombarded with jumping through hoops and passing classes and exams and the uncertainty of becoming a healthcare provider is unnerving. Um, but you just, you know, you have to stay centered in that space of, what you don't know you're going to learn and the best providers don't know everything, but they know how to find out the answers to their questions. And part of that is building an incredible network. And that's where millennials have a real leg up. So, you know, the idealism, I, I, I think that should be kind of our perspective of reality moving forward. And, and I'm really excited to work alongside millennials moving forward as well. Thank you so much for joining me on Exploring Chiropractic. Yeah, thank you.